guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging, and this is yet another video in my National Raw Feeding Week series, and today I'm talking to Daniel Orego. Did I say that right? Indeed, yes. Yes. I got it. And um, we are going to be talking about a really hot topic that keeps coming up in my group and on Facebook, and that is Keto Diets for Pets. And so, Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. No, indeed. Very, and, very pleased. To, uh, to <laughs> and tell me. What exactly is the keto diet? I mean, I know it's, you know, more fat, but sure. that is, it's never that simple. Indeed. You know, it, one, of the, one of the simplest ways to answer that question is the following. A ketogenic meal program or a ketogenic diet is simply any combination of foods that induces nutritional ketosis as validated by blood measures, by measuring ketones and glucose to in fact establish that uh, either yourself if you're doing it or your doggy if they're doing it is in fact in nutritional ketosis. So to recap, a ketogenic diet is any diet that induces nutritional ketosis. Now you hit the nail on the head. Typically that's going to be understood to be uh, a composition of macronutrients that includes a little bit higher fat, very modest protein, and almost zero carbohydrate. And of course, the key to all of that is to ensure that one is sufficiently controlling calories, which is a big part of inducing and sustaining nutritional ketosis. Yeah, I know a lot of people um, over this past year that have been doing um, the keto diet. And sure. I, that was when I first heard about it. I have a coworker who had diabetes and he chose to treat it by changing his diet. I had a coworker who wanted to lose weight and he chose to do so um, by cycling on and off of the keto diet. And when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, here's this new, you know, um, fad diet that everyone's doing. But it worked. And they really um, stayed true to what the diet meant. And so that um, when it started coming up about dogs, it really um, was fascinating to me because now I know that you have seen the um, benefits of treating dogs with cancer by putting them on the keto diet and seeing the cancer vanish. And I was wondering, can you talk to us more about that? Absolutely. And, and the great news is, is that in fact, a ketogenic diet is the furthest thing from a fad that it could be. Uh, while, while it's accurate to observe though, that it's really only in recent times, I would say in the last maybe seven to nine years, that it's come back into the public, public consciousness. But a ketogenic diet was actually founded in the, in the late 20s. Uh, at John Hopkins University um, for application to pediatric epilepsy. So for kids who had refractory seizures uh, and weren't responsive to, say, the standard drug treatments like uh, Keppra or phenobarbital, they would offer those kids uh, a ketogenic diet. And what they would observe is that the, the frequency, the intensity, and the interval uh, of seizure would go down and, of course, in the best cases, really uh, uh, abate. And, you know, fast forward to, you know, the, the mid to late 90s, a ketogenic diet started to be used to address uh, brain cancer, most notably by Dr. Thomas Seafried, um, who really, really looked at how the intersection of metabolism and disease um, could function. And so you then fast forward again, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of history here, uh, but just, just for the sake of being concise, uh, you fast forward again to about three years ago, uh, my colleagues and I at Quest Nutrition established Epigenics Foundation to be able to really look at, in a canine model, can using a ketogenic diet as an intervention along with standard of care uh, to cancer in a canine model actually produce meaningful and substantive results uh, in the real world as validated by pathology, advanced imaging, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really sort of, sort of the, the, the very, very brief history and time of, of the ketogenic diet and how we got to where we are today in, in applying it to, to doggies. And so when I'm, one thing I'm seeing is that, you know, of course, there are the people whose dog was diagnosed with cancer, so now mm -hmm. they're digging deep into the keto diet. Sure. But there are also people who are like, well, if this is good for dogs with cancer, then maybe I should just feed this way um, to keep my dog from getting cancer. So sure. the keto diet shouldn't be used as a preventative, right? Well, that's still being explored, right? In other words, 
there's something that's, that's actually pretty well understood uh, in the sciences. I think we may have even touched on it when we were together last at, at SuperZoo last year, which is it, it doesn't matter if you're dealing with like a bird or uh, a flatworm or a primate or a dog or a human. If one restricts calories by 30%, that organism will not only live longer, mm -hmm. but when it is older, it will appear and behave younger. So controlling calories is really the first step to controlling metabolism. And when you look at uh, uh, length of life as a cofactor, um, it ends up having a pretty significant impact. Now, the next step is, okay, well, how far does controlling the distribution of macronutrients get you? Mm -hmm. Well, it can get you pretty far, right? So, for example, we now know, this is another real, you know, brick in the wall, if you will, uh, Dr. Sarah Halberg over at IUPUI just published her large cohort study looking at type 2 diabetics on a ketogenic diet, whereas whereby 98% of that cohort got off using insulin as a result of that nutritional intervention, right? Now, that's something that we can know quite a bit about now in the human model. The next step is to understand that uh, in a canine model. How far can it go towards relieving what you might call uh, mitochondrial insight as a result of long-term uh, high glycemic uh, feeding mm -hmm. and ultimately can that in fact it, it, you know act as a preventative we don't we don't have all the answers there that we want but obviously that's that's being explored it's and i'm so excited about it because it's it's one of those things where it's so important for us there's just such a growing um thirst of knowledge when it comes mm -hmm. to how to feed our dogs and it's so exciting and I want to give this information to people, right. but it's like, I worry because even I'm sometimes tempted to go, well, if, if, you know, it's like, if this much is good, then twice as much must be better. And it's not always the case. Sure. Sure. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that for both humans and dogs, if you go back, say, you know, 10,000 years ago or so, uh, prior to the advent of agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. Being in ketosis was a very, very normal metabolic state. Why? You, know, you, sort of, you, you go out, you throw the spear, right? You don't get anything. Okay, you're, you're in ketosis. Uh, the next time you go out, you get something. You, know, you eat everything in sight, right? Okay, now you're out of ketosis, right? So, you know, the, this interval of going in and out of ketosis was actually very normal. It's only sort of in the modern epic, and I like to joke about this, that I can actually sit on a couch, Netflix and chill, and eat Hot Pockets all day, and never be in ketosis as a result of that, right? Um, and so the question becomes, okay, how valuable is that metabolic state to canines? You know, and we're talking about canines that aren't in the wild. Right? They're at home, mom and dad. What's the value in that, right? Well, if you, if you look at using ketosis as a way to replicate what a dog's normative experience would be in the wild, at that point, all you're doing is sort of recapitulating what their quote-unquote native experience or ancestral experience might be when it comes to nutrition. So that sounds like fasting, you know, and just reminds us how important fasting is for our dogs. Indeed. I mean, there's a couple of ways to get there, right? Obviously, you can do it with uh, caloric control. You can do it by controlling uh, macronutrients. And you can do it by controlling the window of time where calories are not given or energy is not given to the dog. So that interval fasting that you're describing is just yet one more way to induce nutritional ketosis for a period of time, or in this case, fasted ketosis. Right. That's, I ah, love this. So one thing that I saw, and I'm looking at my notes, one thing, whenever I'm looking for um, you know, information about keto diets, I see the ratio. So four to one, three to one, two to one, one to one. Can you explain what that means? Sure. It, and, and, and I'll give you the, the full disclaimer on it. It's slightly uh, counterintuitive because um, this was created, you know, many moons ago by registered dietitians whose intention was to ensure that the preparation of meals could not be messed up. And so those ratios are actually expressed in gram weight, which, you know, most people don't measure their food in grams. Yes. Um, and so what a four to one ketogenic ratio describes is that for every four grams of fat delivered in a meal, correspondingly, one gram of protein plus carbohydrate is delivered. Now this adds another layer of complexity. Why? Because there's no indication of well, how much protein and how yeah. much carbs. Now you can know intuitively, well, there's probably going to be more protein than carbs, right? 
And at a four to one keto regenerate ratio where 90% of caloric density is coming from fat, there's very little, there's only 10% uh, left for protein and carb. Uh, additionally, you add another layer of complexity. Some people like to use net carbs, which is a, a more accurate uh, assessment of the metabolic impact of a carbohydrate because you're taking total carbohydrates and subtracting fiber, which fibers don't, don't have a, a glycemic impact. Um, and so that's where things can get a little bit squirrely. Um, if you go down the ratio list, right, just for the, 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 the for to alliterate it, uh, a three to one is 87% of calories coming from fat. Mm -hmm. Two to one is 82% of calories com coming from fat. A one to one is 69% of calories coming from fat. And a 0 0.5 to one ketogenic ratio uh, constitutes 53% of calories coming from fat. So uh, a ketogenic diet certainly isn't one thing. Um, that, that expression of ratios, which is essentially determining what the balance of uh, fat calories is going to be, uh, has a very, very wide range. And you really don't see the break until about that one-to-one -one ratio. So a four-to-one, three-to-one, and two-to-one are only separated by three and eight points respectively. They're effectively the same thing for the most part. It's really one-to-one -one where you get down to 69% of calories coming from fat. You say, oh, okay, there might be some tr pr pretty significant metabolic differences here. Uh, not the least of which is you're buying back more room in that meal program for protein. So for people who want to feed, what, you know, what you might call a lifestyle diet, right, or, or a longevity diet that's ketogenic, that 0.5 to 1 ketogenic ratio, that 1 to 1 ketogenic ratio is going to be more serviceable because you're not restricting protein as much. So that's, that's kind of the long and short of it. Okay. And so for the people who are out there doing this and or tempted to try and do it on their own, what could go wrong if you don't know what you're doing? Sure. So there's a couple of caveats and um, one can refer to what I, what I like to call the Iditarod principle, what other people like to call the Adirondack principle. If, if you look at these Huskies that run uh, these incredible sled races, right? Um, their caloric turnover is absolutely massive and they're, they're mainly fed an 80% uh, uh, fat diet. Uh, and this allows them to endure the incredible cold and the tremendous, tremendous exertion uh, that they're under as they're, you know, pulling, pulling these sleds, right? <clears throat> and one thing to keep in mind, and this is crucial, is that those fats are delivered raw, right? They are not cooked. And the reason is the cooked fat uh, becomes peroxidized, and that's when you have massive lipase response uh, and you risk pancreatitis. Whereas with raw fats, even if uh, the percentage of fat is higher, um, you just don't see that. Now, there's not hard science on that. Um, mm -hmm. This is definitely you know, anecdotal. But once you start talking to enough people, you'll see that common thread. Additionally, um, oftentimes people will, will sort of make a boo-boo or an error where they'll say, all right, ketogenic diet. So they'll dump a bunch of kibble in the bowl, and then they'll just like throw butter and oil and stuff on top of that. There again, you're, you're at risk uh, of uh, perhaps inducing a mild pancreatitis. Why? Well, because now you've increased the fats, you've got a big lipase response. You've already got a kibble that's you know probably in the 55 to 60 percent carb range mm -hmm. um, that is in inducing a big amylase response, right? Additionally, if calories are not controlled, now you're inducing a huge insulin response. That's too much taxation on the pancreas. So, so the key to winning, if you will, uh, with a ketogenic diet <coughs> is to ensure that uh, caloric density is sufficiently controlled and that all of the constituents are, are served in raw form rather than cooked. Fantastic. And um, I had one more question. Yeah. How do people learn? I mean, are you going to come out with a book? Are you, is there a cookbook out there in the works? I mean, are you going to start doing workshops? I mean, because there's so much information and this is something I would love to learn how to do, but I am terrified by what I'm seeing on the internet because I don't know what's accurate and what's not. Yeah. I mean, the great news is, is that there's more information. Now to your point, how do you distill that information, apply it and utilize it in a way that's safe and functional and ultimately produces the outcome that you're looking for, which is to induce nutritional ketosis and perhaps in some instances sustain it. Right. Um, well, for people, there's a great book out there um, called The Ketogenic Bible. It was written by uh, 
Dr. Jacob Wilson and Ryan Lowry uh, over at uh, the Applied Science and Performance Institute in Tampa, Florida. Uh, for doggies, there's a phenomenal resource over at Keto Pet Sanctuary. Um, and they put together an ebook which really goes through in fairly meticulous fashion um, not only how to compose, but also what the ratios mean. They recapitulate that. They also give you some resources for background and context as far as the science. Um, and as, as well as uh, a lot of different options when it comes to various meat, fat, and, and veggie selections. Um, a third resource that's out there, uh, of course, I know you're familiar with uh, Dr. Becker and Rodney Habib's uh, dog cancer series. Yes. That man, it, I think in total, you know, not not counting, the, I think two or two and a half hour feature presentation. There you go. You have <laughs> I think it's about 60 plus hours of interviews with the top oncologists, veterinarians, physicians, research scientists, um, and, and you know, essentially domain experts in this world. And man, if you've got those three resources under your belt, you're off to a pretty darn good start. Fantastic. And I will put links to everything in the notes for everybody. And so one question I'm asking everyone during this week is, where do you think 801010 came from? Well, it, it's just an expression of the immense variation that comes with um, uh, using a ketogenic diet. So that, that, that's literally just one permutation uh, of what's possible. Um, there's no you know, magical property about it. Um, it's just one way to go. And the reality is, is even if you're starting with a higher ratio, over time, what you'll notice, and this is what's so interesting about canine metabolism, you'll be able to not only lower that ratio, um, but also increase calories slightly and see that the dog remains in nutritional ketosis. <coughs> Excuse me. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning to talk to me. No worries. It was, it was a pleasure, as always. <laughs> <laughs>